Okay. And these are, uh, these are the topics that we're going to tackle in this presentation. We will talk about the epidemiology, pathophysiology, anatomy, and finally, we'll talk about RF ablation of atrial fibrillation. Uh, of atrial fibrillation. First, we'll start with epidemiology. As we all know, atrial fibrillation is the commonest arrhythmia encountered in clinical practice, and its prevalence increases in the general population with age, reaching up to 5% beyond the age of 65 and up to 10% at the age of 80. Um, it, uh, atrial fibrillation, the problem with atrial fibrillation that is associated with um, higher risk of mortality and morbidity, mainly related to thromboembolic events and heart failure. When we talk about uh, pathophysiology or atrial fibrillation, so we'll start with what's atrial fibrillation, what's meant by atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, it's a, it simply is a chaotic atrial uh, or, uh, chaotic electrical activation of the atrium in which then um, which replaces the normal regular rhythmic activation of the atrium and instead of it we'll have a chaotic electrical activation causing uh, fibrillatory conduction and loss of atrial systole or atrial kick but what is the mechanism of this atrial fibrillation? What is the responsible for this chaotic electrical activation of the, of the atria, both atrium right and left? Uh, there are a lot of research has been done over the few, uh, past few decades, uh, which were very extensive research trying to understand the mechanism underlying uh, or, or causing atrial fibrillation, but still, Although, although we went through a, a, a breakthrough in understanding the mechanism of atrial fibrillation, still the mechanisms underlying atrial fibrillation are still incompletely understood. But currently, we can say that atrial fibrillation results from interaction between the triggers, which are responsible for in its initiation, which plays a major role in the, uh, in the mechanism of, it of paradigmal atrial fibrillation and the substrate which is responsible for its per, uh, perpetuation and uh, perpetuation, which is, um, uh, which is considered to be uh, the major player in the mechanism of persistent atrial fibrillation. In addition to this, there is ionic and anatomic and remodeling, uh, genetic predisposition, and neurohumoral contributors make these interactions more complex. All over the years, as I said before, there was an extensive, uh, extensive research trying to understand the underlying mechanism or the initiators of atrial fibrillation, as well as the uh, what makes uh, atrial fibrillation continues or what maintains atrial fibrillation. Um, one of these research, one important research that was published back in 1985 try to understand what happens in atrial fibrillation. And this breakthrough um, research said that for you to have a maintained atrial uh, fibrillatory rhythm, there should be a critical mass of at least six re-entrant wavelet wavelets uh, or re-entrant circuits moving around in both atria simultaneously or at the same time to allow atrial fibrillation to maintain or to perpetuate perpetuate. So you need at least six re-entrant wavelets or re-entry circuits for atrial fibrillation to be maintained. That's about that's uh, the idea about maintenance or of atrial fibrillation. How about the initiators or the triggers of atrial fibrillation? It was until the breakthrough um, um, a uh, breakthrough trial made by Hazegir in 1994 that we understood what triggers atrial fibrillation. This study, in this study by Hazegir work that started in 1994, and then there was a breakthrough trial published in 1998 that said that atrial, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is caused by focal triggering from uh, 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 multiple sites, mainly the pulmonary veins, and this rig, uh, 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 triggered activity or focal triggers from the pulmonary vein or single pulmonary vein or multiple pulmonary veins are responsible for the fibrillatory or atrial fibrillation rhythm in the atria. And this is the first breakthrough fact that was stated in his work. And the second fact is whenever you ablate this focal triggers or these foci in the pulmonary veins, which is 
wherever it's a single pulmonary vein or multiple pulmonary vein, you will return back to sinus rhythm. And Hasiger was the first, I think Hasiger lab was the first uh, lab or the, the first investigators that uh, stated this, that atrial fibrillation is triggered or participant atrial fibrillation is triggered by, uh, and proved this, proved it, that it's triggered by focal activation, the pulmonary veins. And if you ablate these focal triggers, you can maintain sinus rhythm or you can terminate or get rid of atrial fibrillation. And this is his, uh, this is the intracardiac electrograms or the pulmonary vein potentials or the, uh, obtained from this study that was published in 1998. He, got patients with uh, complaining of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, took them, took them into the lab and went into, uh, did the transeptal puncture, went into the pulmonary vein and tried to record, uh, record electrical activity or triggered activity from the pulmonary veins or a extra uh, or ectopic foci or a premature uh, atrial um, potentials from the pulmonary veins that triggered uh, atrial fibrillation. And he was able to record in many patients around the, his, his population with about 45 patients, he was able to record uh, a triggered activity or spiky potentials that uh, the earliest atrial activation before the uh, atria premature activation or the uh, premature uh, ectopic foci that triggered atrial fibrillation. He could, as we can see here in this intracardiac electrogram that was recorded distally from one of the pulmonary veins, we can see a spiky potential. This is the earliest atrial activation uh, uh, preceding the uh, atria premature that triggered atrial fibrillation, followed by a far field atrial erectogram. That was the intracardiac electrogram uh, recorded just close to the source of the atrial premature. And as he withdrew his catheter near the ostium of the pulmonary vein, you can see this spiky potential or uh, high amplitude potentials uh, becoming or the distance between it and the far field atrium is becoming um, more and more uh, reduced and they become as fused electrogram because you're moving away from the source of this uh, 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 tr uh, uh, triggered in focus or ectopic focus. And his uh, work uh, believed his work included, as I said before, 45 patients, he could, uh, he could record 69 foci, or he can isolate 69 foci for triggered activity or triggered uh, uh, as triggers for, uh, for atrial fibrillation. And 94% of these foci were originated in the pulmonary veins. And as we can see, uh, this electrogram, this is the left atrium and the right atrium, the majority of these foci were located in the pulmonary veins. Uh, very few uh, foci were located or triggered foci were located in the SVC, in the crista terminalis and inferior and around the tricuspid uh, annulus. And uh, the Hesiger or the, this, uh, the um, pulmonary vein triggers is one of the mechanisms or proposed mechanisms of, uh, of initiation of, uh, of atrial fibrillation. Other proposed mechanisms were the micro, we're not gonna talk uh, uh, in, we're, we're, we're just gonna mention them. We're not gonna talk in details about them is the micro reentrant atrial circuits uh, or theory followed. This is the pulmonary vein foci proposed by Hesiger in 1990. Eight, and then there is another theory that was uh, proposed in 2000, uh, which suggested that a focal triggering from the martial ligament is responsible for initiation of atrial fibrillation. Also, there is another theory uh, that is adopted by a lot of investigators. This is the major rotor theory. There is a, a mother rotor that uh, moves around in the atrium, uh, uh, perpetuating into or breaking through into other uh, daughter rotors, and this is the major, and it was suggested that the major cause of atrial fibrillation, especially persistent atrial fibrillation, and finally, cardiac innervation and uh, um, ganglionic plexi were seen to be uh, have a role in the initiation and maintenance of atrial fibrillation, whether it's paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation. All of these are proposed mechanisms of uh, the initiation and maintenance of atrial fibrillation. The most important of them, or the most um, uh, the most important of them, and the most uh, established of them, is the pulmonary vein foci or triggering foci in the pulmonary veins. So now we talked about the theories of initiation of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So what makes the atrial fibrillation 
stays, what maintains atrial fibrillation within the atrium for hours, days, or, or even months. There are also further, um, uh, further mechanisms that were supposed, were, were proposed that um, uh, trying to explain what maintains atrial fibrillation. One of these mechanisms is, are, is that it, it, uh, um, is a, a, st a stable, a single stable focal or the entrant source with fibrillatory conduction, there is a, a single stable focal or reentrant source coming from the pulmonary vein or any other place in the atrium that um, responsible for rapid repetitive activity that causes, uh, that propagates activation of the right atrium and breaks through into different wavelets or fibrillatory conduction. Or maybe another mechanism is uh, multiple wavelets, multiple uh, wavelets propagate randomly across the atrium and they break into daughter wavelets causing uh, fibrillatory conduction or atrial fibrillation rhythm. Another mechanism is micro reentrant circuits circulating around areas of the fibrosis, small areas of fibrosis, or scarring inside the atrium. This micro reentry causes fibrillatory conduction or fibrillatory rhythm. And the last mechanism is a combination of all three mechanisms. That that is known as the drivers or what drives uh, atrial fibrillation to be maintained or perpetuate. Now we'll come to the uh, ECG of atrial fibrillation. As we all know, the ECG of atrial fibrillation is characterized by a rapid ventricular rate, which is irregular with fibrillatory uh, waves, atrial waves in the uh, P, fibrillatory P waves in the ECG. And if we can capture the beginning or the initiation of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or, if, uh, or we can record it, we can document it, we can see that sometimes it's initiated by a premature atrial uh, beat that starts the fibrillatory rhythm, as we can see here at the end of the sinus rhythm, we can see a premature atrial beat that is blocked um, uh, at the atrium and blocked at the ventricle, and then it occurred again, and at this time it initiated atrial fibrillation or fibrillatory rhythm. So this ECG proves that uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, proximal atrial fibrillation is called by trigger activity or uh, triggered uh, premature beats. So when we talk about, uh, when we want to talk about atrial fibrillation ablation before we talk about it, and if you are in the process of, uh, of, of uh, getting into the field of atrial fibrillation ablation, you have to start, you have to know, every uh, electrophysiologist has to know very well the anatomy, his anatomy, the anatomy of the left atrium and the pulmonary veins in order to end up with a successful and uncomplicated procedure. <clears throat> The first part of the anatomy of uh, the left atrium or the most important thing in the anatomy of the anatomy of the left atrium and pulmonary veins is the inter, uh, interatrial septum. The, inter, the anatomy of the interatrial septum is very important because this is the window into the left atrium. This is the, uh, the window or the door through which we can go into the left atrium and do our procedures. And if you know the anatomy of the interatrial septum very well, you will do a transseptal puncture that is successful and uncomplicated with any, any complication. We'll start with the anatomy looking at this graph. This is a sagittal section into the, uh, into the heart showing both atrium, both ventricles. And this is an AP view or rather uh, RAO view. And we can see that um, um, looking at the anatomy, the right atrium and the left atrium, they don't, uh, they don't stand side by side in, in the human heart. The right atrium is usually has a, um, has a right sided, a slightly right sided or anterior position in the heart while the left atrium is posterior and superior to the right atrium. And this relation between the atria is, is one of the causes of making the interatrial septum, it has an oblique course. The plane of the, of the interatrial septum is not uh, just a, um, a, a, a straight line. If you look it at the sagittal plane and look at it, it is the sagittal planes. It has a, 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 um, a, a rather oblique plane uh, in the sagittal plane with an angle of about 65 degrees to the sagittal plane because of the orientation of, it, of both atria towards each other. And if we look at this coronal section, uh, we can see that the, inter, the true interatrial septum, histologically, the true interatrial septum is the, uh, constitutes or is formed from the floor of the fossa ovalis 
as well as the um, the muscular rim that surrounds the fossa valis, which is the uh, ostium primum. Uh, sorry, the um, not the ostium okay. primum. The uh, yeah, yeah, so. el, el uh, the ostium primum. Uh, are you the septum primum? The septum primum septum is prime. the true septum. The septum primum is the true septum together with this the muscular ridge uh, ring around it. This constitutes the true part of the septum. And if we look at this coronal section, this is very important. This is anterior, this is posterior, this is the, the uh, RVOT and pulmonary artery, and this is the aorta. And here is the tricost annulus and the mitral annulus. This is the right atrial appendage. And between them, the interatrial septum, this is the posterior valus. This view is very important because anterior, uh, anterior to the posterior valus, this is the muscular rim of it. And more anterior to it, some, a part known as the aortic mound this the most anterior part of the system known uh, the septum known as the aortic uh, mound this uh, is just posterior or just behind the aorta and uh, at this position you can record the his bundle recording and when you put a, a catheter in here this is corresponds to the his position or the his uh, that's why when we do a transeptal puncture we put a his catheter that can mark the, 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 award, uh, the aorta for us, and also it marks the uh, his boundary recording. This is very important, the aortic, the aortic mound is very important because your catheter or your transeptal needle should be here, should be in the fossa ovalis. If you move it a little bit anterior to this aortic mound, okay, or close to the his, your his bundle catheter, you're, you're prone to puncture into the aorta. So this is a very pla important place. You have to stay away from it. And if we look at this uh, specimen, this is a sagittal section, as if you're looking at the right atrium, you're looking into the right atrium uh, from uh, the uh, R uh, uh, view, similar to the area view. This is the SVC, this is the IVC, and here is the uh, septum with the fossa ovalis in here. And this is the coronary sinus uh, ostium, and this is the tricuspid annulus. And this is the supposed place of the AV node and the Hisbonder region. And if we look here, the fossa ovalis in, in relation to the Hisbondal or the AV node is posterior and a little bit superior to it. That's where you have to put your catheter in REO, view, in RE, in REO fluoroscopic view. Your transeptal puncture, your transeptal needle should be here because this is the place of the Vossel valves, which is anatomically located posterior and a little bit superior to the his bonder region or the, uh, the AV node region. If we look here, this is the next image. Sorry. This is the image magnified. This is the fossa ovalis, coronary, ostium, uh, coronary sinus ostium, inferior vena cava, tricast annulus, and this is the Koch triangle, and this is the AV node. The, and the his bonder region is perforating the septum here. If we, so this is the position of your his catheter. In REO view, you have to put your transeptal puncture just behind it, a little bit superior. This is this place of the anatomical place of the fossa ovalis. Okay, and if you move a little bit, so when you move your trans, if you move your transeptal uh, needle a little bit anterior, you are uh, closer to your landmark is the his catheter. You're bound to perforate into the aorta because the his catheter is just behind or just uh, just behind the aorta. Okay, we'll go. To the second, we'll talk about the left atrial anatomy or the anatomy of the left atrium. This is a sagittal section in, in the heart. This is the right atrium and this is the left atrium. And if we look into the left atrium, the, uh, the uh, left atrium is formed from several components, the same components as the right atrium, a posterior component known as the venous component, which uh, receives the four pulmonary veins two right veins on the right side, just behind the interatrial septum, and two left pulmonary veins on the left side, just behind the left atrial appendage. There is the body as well as the vestibule. The vestibule is the part of the left atrium just above the mitral annulus. And the last part of the left atrium is the left atrial appendage with the finger-like projection, which is, uh, lies anterior, just anterior to the left pulmonary vein and it's trabeculated from inside. If, as we look in here, if we look in here into this sagittal section, we can see that we can appreciate that most of the left atrium 
uh, it has a smooth surface compared to the right atrium. The majority of the right atrium, or more, more than half of the right atrium is trabeculated, while the left atrium, the majority of it is a smooth surface except for the left atrial appendage. And if we look, if we have uh, looked inside the left atrium, we look closely into the left atrial appendage, which, as I said before, it lies anterior to the left-sided pulmonary veins. We can appreciate that there is a muscular ridge between the left pulmonary veins, which are posterior to the left atrial appendage, and the left atrial appendage. And there is quite a variation in the structure of this uh, uh, ridge, which was uh, between the left pulmonary veins and left atrial appendage. Th there is a variation in their width, in, in its width, in its length, and its uh, uh, position here. And if we look at this dotted line, this is a very important line. This is the, uh, that extends between the left inferior pulmonary vein and the mitral annulus anteriorly. This line is the mitral edmus line. Usually, we can ablate at this site or this line, we do the mitral isthmus line during ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation or whenever you're going to do linear ablation of atrial fibrillation. Here, this is the lift atrium looking, uh, the, how the lift atrium looks from the outside. This is an AP view, so we are looking from the front. The most anterior structures of the lift atrium is the mitral annulus and the left atrial appendage. And behind them, the posterior and posterior position uh, draining into the venous component or, or the posterior wall of the lift atrium are the four pulmonary veins on the right side the right superior and right inferior pulmonary veins, and behind the left atrial appendage is the left superior and the left inferior pulmonary vein. And if we can appreciate from here that the superior pulmonary veins have a little bit of an anterior uh, position compared to the pulmonary veins. So the most posterior pulmonary veins are the inferior veins, while the superior veins have a little bit of anterior position. All of these informations are very important when you go into the left atrium and try to map the left atrium during atrial fibrillation. When you know the position of the structures, different structures inside the left atrium, it's very important, uh, even if you go uh, uh, blindly with, uh, or non-fluoroscopy without fluoroscopy under the guidance of the 3D electroanatomical mapping, you will know, you will have an appreciation of the anatomy. You will know the spatial relation of different structures, so you wouldn't do anything or, or you, you wouldn't do um, uh, any complications to or perforate anything. Uh, another important thing we have to know that there is a marked variation in the anatomy of the pulmonary veins. So what does that mean? In the pulmonary veins, they don't look the same in from one person to the other. There's close variation in their anatomy. Sometimes you have uh, the uh, you, you uh, sometimes you have four different pulmonary veins: two on the right and two on the left, with separate ostia draining into the left atrium. Sometimes you have a common pulmonary vein. One uh, sometimes you have a common left or common right, and sometimes you have an accessory vein, and it's usually seen on the right side, an accessory middle vein between the right sphere and right inferior, and to less to the lesser extent you can have an accessory or an additional vein uh, inside uh, uh, on the left side this is important that this was an important information when we back in the days we used to do a segmental rf ablation of the pulmonary veins where you have to ablate around the ostia of the pulmonary veins so you you should have known how many veins on each side you know in order not to miss uh, an accessory vein. But nowadays we do circumferential or anterior ablation, so it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not very important as before to know the uh, the exact anatomy of the uh, veins, but it's it's nice to know, especially if you have a common vein, because the common, the common veins, they have a large ostia, so sometimes your circular catheter doesn't sit well inside the pulmonary vein because it's very big, so you have to move it around this common vein up and down to get uh, to, to have a better recording of the pulmonary vein potentials inside the pulmonary vein. The next thing we're going to talk about in the anatomy is the myoarchitect architecture of the lift atrium. It's very important to know that the lift atrium is electrically, con electrically connected to the pulmonary veins by a mean of myocardial sleeves. What does it mean? We all know that the muscular uh, structure of any vein is not well developed, but in the 
incident uh, in the event of pulmonary veins, the muscular, uh, the uh, cardiomyocytes or the muscular um, uh, uh, fibers of the walls of the left atrium, they extend to a uh, certain extent inside the pulmonary veins. As we can see here, this line, uh, this dotted black lines, they mark the ostia of the four pulmonary veins. We can see that the muscle fibers extend as sleeves a little bit inside the pulmonary veins and they extend further in uh, inside the pulmonary vein, the superior pulmonary veins compared to the inferior uh, uh, pulmonary veins. That's why we have triggered activities from within the pulmonary veins because you have muscle wall or muscle fibers inside the wall of the pulmonary veins. The myocardial sleeves are, uh, studies showed that the myocardial sleeves are thickest at the venoatrial junction here. The, sorry, they are thickest at this site. Also, studies, histological studies or structural studies have shown that there is a complex cardio, uh, cardio myocardial uh, bundle arrangement inside the myocardial sleeves. What does that mean? That you, the muscle fibers, the arrangement of the muscle fibers inside the myocardial sleeve is very complex. You have some muscle fibers that run in circular pattern, interacting with a longitudinally running muscle fibers. This different arrangement in the muscle fibers inside the myocardial sleeve that runs into the pulmonary veins is responsible for anisotropic conductions and can be responsible for the creation of triggered activity or even micro reentry inside the wall of the pulmonary vein. That's why you have triggered activity or micro reentry that initiates uh, atrial fibrillation inside the pulmonary veins that can initiate atrial fibrillation. There's also as well, there's a complex structure or arrangement of muscle fibers inside the wall of the left atrium as well. You have a very complex substrate in the, in the left atrial wall, especially the posterior wall. The muscle bundle arrangement it goes in layers from uh, epicardium to endocardium. You have different layers of muscle fibers running in different directions. You have longitudinal fibers interacting with, with the oblique fibers, with circular fibers. Also, this um, act as a very uh, rich environment for creation of atrial uh, fibrillation drivers or, uh, or uh, a baseline for the mechanisms for perpetuation or the initiation of rotors or micro reentry or uh, uh, different mechanisms that maintains and perpetuate atrial fibrillation, especially in persistent atrial fibrillation. Finally, we have to know the, the anatomy of the important neighboring structures of the left atrium, because it's very important to know the an anatomy of neighboring structures to the left atrium when we are going to perform atrial fibrillation ablation in order not to injure these, uh, these structures with RF current while you're ablating, you're ablating atrial fibrillation. There are two important structures that we have to know the anatomy of them very well. Uh, one of them is the phrenic nerves. We have to know the anatomy of the phrenic nerves because they are the lying close proximity to the left atrial structures as well as the esophagus. We'll start first with the phrenic nerves. We have a right phrenic nerve and a left phrenic nerve. The right phrenic nerve, as we can see here in this uh, uh, heart specimen, an AP view, as we are looking at the heart at the AP view, okay, we can see the right phrenic nerve is running along the right border of the right of the right border of the heart. And if we look from a right lateral view, you can see that the right phrenic nerve is just runs in the groove between the SVC and right atrium anteriorly and the right pulmonary veins, especially a right superior pulmonary vein posteriorly. So whenever you are ablating in close proximity to the SVC, the lateral right atrium or the ostium of the right veins, especially right superior pulmonary vein, you can easily injure the, the right phrenic nerve. So you have to, whenever you are ablating in close proximity to these structures, you have to make sure that you're away from the phrenic nerve, you stimulate and you stay away from it. Uh, as far as the left uh, pulmonary vein, the left phrenic nerve, the left phrenic nerve has different courses. Uh, um, in some cases, it runs along the the anterior or the, the anterior wall of the left ventricle uh, in close proximity to the LED or the great cardiac vein. Uh, one of the, uh, the third course of it and second course, it can run with the obtuse marginal artery. And the third course, it runs a close in, uh, in front of the left atrial appendage. 
So whenever you ablate in close proximity to this area, to the left atrial appendage or the ostium of the left pulmonary vein, you can injure the left, uh, left phrenic nerve. But the most common to injure during um, RF ablation of, um, uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation is the right phrenic nerve if you're ablating close to the ostium of the right superior pulmonary vein, like in cryo balloon ablation, you can injure easily the right, superior, uh, the right phrenic nerve. So it's very important to know the anatomy very well. The second structure that we have to know about, about its uh, anatomy is the esophagus, because the, if we, when we look here uh, at the heart, this is a heart specimen look, uh, with, uh, viewed from the left lateral view, we can see that the left atrium is the most posterior structure in the heart. And we can, uh, uh, we can appreciate that here in the esophagus is squeezed in between the left, a left atrium, posterior wall of the left atrium, and the descending uh, thoracic aorta. And when we do a sagittal section in the left atrium, this is anterior and this is posterior, okay? And this is a sag sagittal section in the heart. We can go through the heart from anterior to posterior. This is the right ventricle, R R R R RVOT, um, pulmonary artery. This is the left atrium, the left pulmonary veins, and this is more pos posterior, the esophagus you can appreciate that the esophagus is in very close proximity to the posterior wall of the left atrium. In fact, they, if histologically, they share, they share the same adventitia. This is how close they are to each other and, and how it's easily you can injure the esophagus by RF energy if you're ablating close to the posterior, the, the uh, posterior aspect of the antra of the left pulmonary veins or the right pulmonary veins or the posterior wall, if you're doing linear ablations in the posterior wall. Second important thing about the esophagus, we have to know that it's not a static structure, it's a movable structure. So in one instant, it can lie just behind the posterior wall of the left atrium. In half an hour later, you can see it behind the left pulmonary veins. And here in this coronal, uh, coronal section of the heart, we can see the esophagus lies just behind the right pulmonary veins, right pulmonary veins. So since it's, an, a, it's a movable structure, it's very important all through the procedure to know where is it. Either yeah, by, by, by making barium swallow, so to, to see it through the procedure, or sometimes indirectly through do, putting an, a temperature probe inside the esophagus to monitor the temperature of the esophagus, uh, the lumen of the esophagus, while you do your RF ablation all through. This is protective for the esophagus in order not to injure the esophagus, because you know, if we injure the esophagus, we'll end up with a very, very um, risky uh, complication, which is the atrioesophageal fistula, which is a fatal complication. Now we'll go to the last part of our presentation, which is the atrial fibrillation ablation. Now we know um, we, we know uh, our information about the epidemiology, the pathophysiology, we have a hint about the pathophysiology, and we took thoroughly about the left atrial anatomy and pulmonary vein anatomy, as well as the interatrial septum. Now, I think we're more comfortable to understand the atrial fibrillation and ablation, the concept behind, we knew the concept behind it, behind it from the pathophysiology and the mechanism of atrial fibrillation. Um, we'll talk about first about the history of uh, atrial fibrillation ablation. Of course, the history of atrial fibrillation ablation started with the breakthrough study of Hasegir that was published back in 1998, who said that the atrial fibrillation process of atrial fibrillation ablation is triggered by, by triggered activity or focal activity that is most probably coming from the pulmonary vein, 94% of his patients. And if you ablate these triggers, you'll have a maintenance of sinus rhythm with a very high success rate. And I think in his study, it was beyond 60% or something, although he was doing focal ablation. So ablation of atrial fibrillation started with focal ablation, that you have to go inside the, the, um, the active pulmonary vein or triggering vein, and you map this triggering activity. Usually it's, it's, it's distal inside the vein. It's not close to the ostium. It's usually the, the foci are distal inside the vein as at, was uh, mentioned by Hasegger group. And you go and you map the earliest atrial activation while this vein is triggering and you ablate it. That was the first, uh, 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 our first encounter or the first, uh, history of RF ablation, it was focal ablation. Of course, fo uh, focal ablation 
is associated with a high risk of pulmonary vein stenosis because you're ablating way inside the vein. So you have increased risk of pulmonary vein stenosis. And there is another problem. Um, you can go inside the cath lab and your trigger in pulmonary vein is not triggering anymore. So you have to wait the, for success of this procedure, your, your trigger in vein should be triggering or discharging right now at this moment, or you stay in the cath lab waiting for this vein to trigger. So to, so it's a very, it was a time consuming procedure and it was not a practical procedure. Then this evolved into the second thing that you have to, in, uh, instead of trying to map the triggering activity and look for uh, early stitcher activation and ablated, you can simply isolate this triggering vein by ablating, by causing circular ablation around the palmar vein. You electrically isolate it from the rest of the atrium at the ostium and you ablate at the ostium. But do, do you have, uh, do you start, do you do ablation of one single vein or the four veins? They started by ablating the triggering vein, but as I said before, you can, sometimes you cannot identify the trigger and vein inside the cath lab. So they ended up with segmental or uh, isolation of the ostia of the four pulmonary veins because you cannot identify the trigger and vein in the cath lab. Secondly, any vein can trigger at any time. This vein is triggering now, tomorrow the other vein can be triggering, but it's better and safest to increase your success rate. You ablate the four pulmonary veins at the ostia. But this procedure, uh, it was, uh, of course, under fluoroscopy. Second procedure, second, it was associated with uh, increased risk of pulmonary vein stenosis as well as, as the focal ablation. Second, you can, it's easily to injure the phrenic nerve. It was associated with high risk of phrenic nerve injury, especially the right phrenic nerve, because it's close to the ostium of the right superior pulmonary vein. That led to the evolution into what we're doing right now, which is wide area circumferential ablation, that you still disconnect the pulmonary vein or isolate the, pulmonary, pul the four pulmonary vein, but you ablate away from the ostia. This, these are the ostia the, uh, the, of the pulmonary vein. Uh, the, uh, this is an, an electro anatomical map of a left atrium. Uh, see, looking from uh, AP view. So these are the right pulmonary vein, right superior, right inferior. And this is the uh, left superior and left inferior. And this is the appendage right in front of them. If you do wide area circumferential ablation, what do you mean by what area? You stay from the ostium, you go into the antrum of the uh, left atrium. The, uh, and you can electrically identify the antrum, as I'm going to tell you later on. And you do a circumferential ablation all through the antrum of four of the four pulmonary vein, or two of the right and two of the left. And you electrically isolate the pulmonary vein. This is what we do right now: circumferential pulmonary vein isolation. And uh, since it's not an all steel thing, it's an anterior thing. So this procedure was made so easier by the introduction of 3D anatomical, 3D uh, electroanatomical mapping systems, whether they are the CARTO system or the NAVIX system or any other system. So you create an anatomy of the left atrium, you identify the pulmonary veins, the ostia of the pulmonary veins, you can, uh, you can identify the antra, you identify the whole left atrial wall and the appendage, you create an anatomy of the left atrium. You can do it, you can navigate through the pulmonary vein and put your mapping catheter in different positions in the left atrium without the guidance of, um, of fluoroscopy. You actually visualize the left atrial anatomy. Under fluoroscopy, you imagine the anatomy and you, uh, you apply the anatomy that's printed in or seared inside your brain into the fluoroscopy. But, under, but in 3D electroanatomical mapping, you actually see the anatomy of the left atrium. So you can place your ablation lesions in accurate positions as far as much as you can. And of course, you don't do it only anatomically. You, you, you're just aided by electrophysiological. You put a, a, a mapping catheter, most important mapping catheter is a circular catheter. You, you, you introduce them into the uh, uh, different pulmonary veins, um, one after the other. To make to record the pulmonary vein potentials from the myocardial sleeves of these pulmonary veins, and you record the isolation of these 
pulmonary vein pot uh, pulmonary veins by disappearance of these pulmonary vein potentials after creation of a complete lesions around the pulmonary veins. This technique is thought to have better results, have better success rates because it targets, it triggers sources because you isolate the pulmonary veins and osteal drivers, as we talked before, the drivers that perpetuate pulmonary veins are present in the osteum, in the ostia, and also the autonomic denervation causes autonomic denervation because also they are close to the ostia of the pulmonary vein or the antra of the pulmonary vein. So you're hitting different birds with one stone. Uh, pulmonary vein isolation is associated with high success rate of freedom of atrial fibrillation recurrence. The success rate of the first procedure uh, is 60 to 79%, and at three years from 60 to 72%, and it, at five years, it's 68%, it's very good. And I think after second procedure, uh, after a second procedure, it can go up to 75% or maybe 80%. And this is how the pulmonary vein potentials look like before ablation and how they are not there anymore after isolation. And I will talk about them in, uh, in details later on. So is RF ablation of atrial fibrillation comprises only of trigger uh, isolation, which is pulmonary vein isolation? No, there was back in the days in 10 years ago or more, there was something called substrate modification. We still do it right now, but maybe we are not heavy handed in substrate modification nowadays as we did before. Uh, and substrate modification was preserved for uh, persistent atrial fibrillation because it was believed that the mechanism of persistent atrial fibrillation is not related only to triggered activity in pulmonary veins. The substrate has a, a, um, a big role in the uh, initiation and maintenance of persistent atrial fibrillation. That's why research and trials or, or ablation procedures were more targeted towards modification of the substrate in addition to isolation of the triggers in the pulmonary veins. So this, this led to uh, different strategies or techniques of ablation like cafe ablation, in which we target uh, fractionated, we target complex fractionated signals. Uh, we target by, their, by ablation of them using this strategy. In, uh, and it was clear, it, uh, it was one of the mechanism of ablating persistent atrial fibrillation. 10 years ago or more, um, in different sites in the left atrium. We're mapped for them. We we'll look for these complex fractionated potentials or ectograms, and there are different algorithms embedded in different machines with, or 3D electroanatomical mapping to identify these electrograms and targeted ablated. Uh, also, there were another procedure techniques for ablation or for substrate modification and persistent atrial fibrillation known as the linear ablation, in which we create linear lesions in different sites in the left atrium. After you do your pulmonary vein isolation, some, the most usual linear ablations are roof creating of a complete linear roof line. Uh, in the posterior wall and a floor line. And sometimes you do an anterior line attaching the uh, uh, right superior pulmonary vein, connecting the right superior pulmonary vein and to the, uh, to anteriorly to the uh, anterior uh, part of the mitral annulus. And of course the left isthmus, uh, uh, mitral isthmus line, as I, as I showed you before in the anatomy, it extends from the left inferior pulmonary vein to the mitral annulus, you can do uh, uh, a, group, uh, um, a few of these lines or all of them uh, in ablation of the uh, persistent atrial fibrillation. Also, there was uh, another technique that was created and which was believed in by different investigators, which is rotor mapping uh, using um, uh, intracardiac or even uh, external way of mapping the rotors inside the left atrial, uh, inside the left atrium trying to localize the mother rotor or the rotor activity inside the left atrium and mapping. And also this technique adapted, was adapted for ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation. But several recent studies like STAR-AF and most pre, uh, predominantly star 2 trial that examined these, all these techniques uh, uh, in relation to pulmonary vein isolation alone, and pulmonary vein isolation alone proved to be the standard or was non-inferior to pulmonary vein isolation plus any of these techniques 
um, uh, in uh, ablation of persistent atrial fibrillation. So the most recent guidelines have made the, the adoption of these techniques as a class 2B indication. Whenever you have a patient with persistent atrial fibrillation, the first thing you have to do is pulmonary vein isolation. Even if he has recurrence or the second procedure that the STARI FF2 trial said, you, if you, you have to map for a recur, a reconnection in the pulmonary vein. If you have a, a re, pulmonary vein reconnection, you re-isolate the pulmonary veins and you get out. You don't do any additional ablation. If you, if you do additional ablation in the form of cafe or linear in one, uh, on only one thing, if you found that you have a complete isolation of the pulmonary vein, so you go for either one of these protocols. Okay, uh, but uh, they these uh, these uh, uh, techniques in the most recent guidelines, based on these large randomized trials, have to have taken a back seat in the ablation of atrial uh, of persistent atrial fibrillation. So, despite the different techniques. Uh, circumferential pulmonary vein isolation remains the cornerstone of the treatment of atrial fibrillation, regardless of atrial fibrillation form and of the duration of atrial fibrillation. No strategy consistently demonstrated superiority to pulmonary vein isolation in preventing long-term recurrences of atrial arrhythmias. It's notable that higher rates of success are reported after multiple procedures of pulmonary vein isolation. So now we'll talk about the uh, pulmonary vein uh, circumferential or RF circumferential pulmonary vein isolation step by step. Okay, how are we going to do our pulmonary vein isolation? F first, uh, the pulmonary vein isolation it's a, a major procedure, and it uh, has to be be done meticulously. There are pre procedural preparation that has to be done very well. Most important pre-procedure preparation is to do a TEE for the patient before your procedure to exclude uh, lift atrial thrombi or lift atrial appendage thrombi. Uh, usually, the procedure is done under general anesthesia, and uh, once you did your transeptal puncture, you, you the patient the patient has to be properly anticoagulated all through the procedure with a target uh, activated clotting time more than three hundred seconds. As we can see here, this is the platform where we do our procedures in our cath lab, which is well equipped with the high technology equipments, a 3D uh, mapping system, uh, whatever its type, is, if it's uh, Navix or Carto, with fluoroscopy, an intracardiac recording machine, an ablator, and sometimes an ICE, intracardiac uh, uh, echocardiography, or even a transesophageal echo. So it was well equipped EP lab. And it, uh, it has to be done, of course, under complete sterilization or complete aseptic conditions. The first thing we, we do to start our, uh, our uh, RF ablation procedure, PV isolation, is lift atrial access. And lift atrial access is done through transeptal puncture. And transeptal puncture is, in the majority of labs, is done under the uh, guidance of fluoroscopy. In certain centers, they do it under guidance of fluoroscopy, as well as intracardiac echocardiography or transesophageal echo for more safety uh, or medical legal purposes. Um, but the standard is to do it under fluoroscopy guidance. Um, I forgot what I was saying. You're, the equipment's needed. You, uh, some centers usually do, uh, most of the centers do a transept, two uh, double transeptal punctures, one for the ablation catheter and a second for the circular mapping catheter uh, that is going to be introduced into the, uh, the pulmonary veins to um, to record the pulmonary vein potentials and to ensure electrical isolation of the pulmonary veins, but some centers do a single transeptal puncture. It depends on what you're convenient with. Uh, the equipments include a broken brown needle and two long transeptal uh, sheath is if you're going to do a double transeptal puncture. As I said before, in the majority of centers, we do it under fluoroscopic guidance. And you have to have understanding, a, a very big understanding of the anatomy of both right atrium, left atrium, and interatrial septum. That's why I had, uh, I took a long time uh, uh, um, talking in details about the anatomy because it's very important. It, that's what will make your transeptal puncture is easier, understanding anatomy. This is an REO view, an LAO view. 
And if we can see here, you have to position your catheter in, R, in both views, RAO view and LAO view, or your, transept, uh, your transeptal needle. Before positioning your transeptal needle, you should have two guiding catheters just for landmark. You put a His catheter, a His catheter here, it's RV, but usually it's a His catheter placed on the His position. And as this before, this position is very important because in area view, you can identify the position of the fossa ovalis in relation to the position of the his. Also, it's a landmark of the aorta. That may, this is the red flag that you have to stay away from. You have to stay as posterior to it because if you are close to the his catheter, you're prone to puncture the aorta. Also, the, the second landmark is the uh, decapolar catheter inside the coronary sinus. It marks the, the inferior and posterior border of the left atrium. Okay, and it marks the mitral annulus, the separation between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Okay, uh, you position your uh, transeptal puncture in area of view. So in, in area of view, your needle should be posterior and a little bit superior to the his catheter that is supposed to be here or here. It's positioned here. Okay, and you don't put you you don't place it too much posterior because if you place it too much posterior, you puncture the posterior wall of the right atrium and go directly into the right into the pericardium. And if it's too much anterior, you're going, you're going to puncture the aorta, and this is uh, complications you don't want to have. In LA of you, it has to be midway between the uh, his catheter and the coronary sinus catheter. And here, as we can see here, you're tenting the interatrial septum, you inject your dye, and you see tenting of the interatrial septum, that this is the perfect position. You puncture, this is your puncture site. Now you see your needle inside the left atrium. This is an area of view, and you advance your wire into the one of the left pulmonary veins, whether the left superior or left inferior. Now you've done a successful uh, transeptal puncture. You can do it again for the second transeptal puncture, and you puncture at the fossa ovalis. Uh, of course, after you do your transeptal puncture, you have continuous infusion of the sheath with hyperonized saline for fear of thromboembolism. Some centers, as I said before, they do the, the transeptal puncture under guidance of ice, a little intracardiac electrogram. And you can see here the needle, uh, the tendon of the interatrial septum and the needle going through the septum from the right atrium into the left atrium. It's better way to visualize your needle going through the septum and it's more safe than fluoroscopy in certain instances. Another value of intracardiac electro, uh, echocardiogra uh, echocardiography is not only the transeptal puncture, you can manipulate your catheter and you make sure where your catheter are using eyes. You can see, you can easily see your circular catheter inside left superior, left inferior pulmonary vein, uh, inside the ostium or way inside the vein using eyes. So it can help you see, um, uh, navigate your catheter inside the left atrium or ensure, make sure where your catheter is. Second thing, after gaining access into the left atrium through transeptal puncture, and you do it successfully without complication, you start creating your left atrial geometry using whatever 3D mapping system you're using. You start creating an anatomical map, as we can see here. This is an anatomical map of the left atrium created by a, a CARTU system. This is an AP view. We can see that this is the right superior pulmonary, this is the right side, and this is the left side, guys. And this is the left atrium, video of the left atrium rotating. So now this is the back of the patient. So this is the right side and left side. This is the right, right superior pulmonary vein, right inferior pulmonary vein, here, we're going back into AP view. So this is the left atrial appendage, left superior pulmonary vein, left inferior pulmonary vein, and downwards and anteriorly. This is the mitral annulus. And as we, the left atrium rotates, this is the posterior wall of the left atrium. And while you do your anatomical map, you have to tag your ostia. You know your ostium by two things. You do it by fluoroscopy. Uh, you put your uh, ablation catheter inside the left. Of course, you do. Uh, if you do two transeptal punctures, you, you one transeptal 
puncture use it for uh, placing your circular catheter inside the left atrium and which you navigate inside each one of the pulmonary veins and as well as the ablation catheter. You can do your geometry or you create your map using your ablation catheter, which is the CARTO catheter or the uh, circular catheter if it's a navigation catheter, if it's a uh, uh, lastonab or something. And uh, uh, identification of the ostia, you can do it electrically or by fluoroscopy. You advance your catheter inside the pulmonary vein, inside the left, uh, the, say the left superior pulmonary vein. You go inside the pulmonary vein and you start recording pulmonary vein potentials first. And you start withdrawing your catheter till it drops, till it drops. Once it drops, you advance it again into the pulmonary vein, just a, a tiny bit. This site, it marks the, the uh, ostium. Also, you can do it electrically. When you go with the, your catheter inside the pulmonary vein, you, start, uh, you will start recording very sharp, spiky potentials. These are the pulmonary vein potential. As you withdraw the, uh, the catheter inside uh, the left atrium, you will have another electrogram recorded just before the pulmonary vein potential, which is low frequency and low amplitude. This is the far field atrium. Once you have a small far field atrium followed by a spiky PV potential, this marks the site of the ostium of the pulmonary vein. And this is the, the intracardiac recording you obtain at the ostium. This is our ablation catheter or the circular catheter inside the pulmonary vein, the pulmonary ostium of the left superior pulmonary vein. This is the recording you get from the left superior pulmonary vein. Since the left superior pulmonary vein is in close proximity to the right atrial appendage, so the circular catheter will record two recordings. An early recording, which is low amplitude and low frequency, which is the far field atria recording, followed by a spiky sharp high frequency potential, which is the pulmonary vein potential. As you advance the circular catheter inside the pulmonary vein, this pulmonary vein potentials will be larger and will stay away, will be uh, separated from the far field atrial electrograms with, uh, will be more distal or more away from it because you're moving distal. And sometimes you lose the, this uh, far field atrial uh, electrograms. Uh, you lose it. You'll only record pulmonary vein potential. This is the recording from the ostium. And, sin, and uh, um, uh, at the left superior pulmonary vein, they are, sometimes they are superimposed over each other. In order to separate both far field and pulmonary vein potentials from each other, the, uh, the early potential from the late potentials, you can start pacing from the coronary sinus. Once you start pacing from the coronary sinus, you can separate the early far field atrium from the late pulmonary vein potentials. As you go for ablation, you start your circumferential ablation, you will notice that there is, fur there is delay of the pulmonary vein potentials from the far field atrium and further delay, further delay till it disappears. You, and you are left only with the far field atrium. This means that you electrically isolated the pulmonary vein from the atrium. There is no more electrical communication between both and there is no conduction into the pulmonary vein. So you lose the spiky potentials and you're left with the far field atrial potential. This means that you completely isolate this, uh, uh, this vein and this is entrance block. Okay, this is also an intracardiac electrogram obtained from the left superior pulmonary vein. We, we can appreciate the early far field uh, atrial potential followed by the pulmonary vein potential. They are separated because we started our ablation and you can appreciate that there's a progressive delay of the pulmonary vein potentials from the far field atrium till the, uh, the late uh, pulmonary vein potentials disappear and you're left only with the far field earlier potentials, which are the atrial electrograms. Your energy settings during RF circumferential ablation, usually uh, RF energy uh, titrated from 35 to 40 watts, 35 for the posterior part and uh, 40 watts for the anterior part with an external irrigation flow rate around 30 milliliter per minute. This is um, the this is an anatomical map or the uh, left atrial geometry of a, one patient of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This is an anatomical map and this is a voltage map. Sometimes we do anatomical map and sometimes we do voltage map. What do you mean by voltage map? That we uh, do 
a mapping of the voltage of the left atrium to know if we have a healthy myocardium inside the left atrium where there's scar tissue. Usually voltage map is very valuable in patients with, uh, with persistent atrial fibrillation because usually patients with persistent atrial fibrillation have scarring of the left atrium. So voltage map can help us identify these areas of scarring to deal with it or ablate around it. And the voltage, the, uh, the normal voltage inside the atrium takes the violet color, while the areas of scar tissue takes the red color. Uh, the, uh, the red color identifies dense scar, and scarring tissue takes the rainbow colors, the colors uh, green, uh, uh, blue, or whatever. So uh, the red color identifies dense scar, and the normal myocardium uh, is has a violet color. So, uh, and if we look at this voltage map of patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, we can appreciate that the anterior wall, septum, and the appendage of the lift of this lift atrium in RAO view is completely has no, completely normal voltage, and we can see that we have circumferential ablation around the antrum of the right veins. This is RAO view, and this is the front of the patient. So this is right side and left side. This is the right superior, right inferior pulmonary vein. This is circumferential lesions around the. Uh, the right pulmonary veins around the antrum of the right pulmonary veins, that is the left atrial appendage. And this is the PA view we're looking from behind. So this is the right side and this is the left side. And on the left side, we can see that the left pulmonary veins are common pulmonary veins. They are not uh, separate ostia. And here is the circumferential lesions around the uh, left pulmonary veins and the right pulmonary veins. And this is the voltage of the posterior wall looks normal, healthy. We have a healthy left it posterior wall of the left atrium. And this is from a left lateral view. We are looking at the left lateral view. This is this patient has a huge left atrial appendage. And this is the common left pulmonary vein with the lesions in the uh, uh, in the uh, ridge between the left atrial appendage and the left common vein. And this is how we, how, so after we do our lesions around the pulmonary veins, the right pulmonary veins and left pulmonary vein, and we can see, as we can see here in this video, we have to ensure that we obtain a complete pulmonary vein isolation. How we ensure it, we have to make sure that we isolate the pulmonary vein electrically by ensuring entrance block and exit block. As I mentioned before, this is the uh, pulmonary vein potentials reported by the circular catheter in the left superior pulmonary vein. This is the early far field atrium and the late pulmonary vein potential. As we ablate, there is a gradual, as I said before, gradual uh, delay of the pulmonary vein potentials they, till they completely disappear. Once they completely disappear, this is entrance block. And in the majority of literature uh, of atrial fibrillation ablation, this is more than enough to say that you isolated the pulmonary veins. Uh, in a lot of centers, they, uh, they say whenever you achieve entrance block, so you ensure this is, makes you 100% uh, are, are sure that you isolated these pulmonary veins. Other, other methods uh, are suggested but are not adapted by all centers is trying to ensure that you have exit block. What does it mean? That you're not conducting entrance block means that you're not conducting from the atrium to the pulmonary veins. That's why you, you have no pulmonary vein potentials. But exit block ensures that you're not conducting from the left atrium to, the, sorry, from the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. So whenever you pace from the circular catheter inside, sorry, inside, uh, inside, sorry, when, whenever you're pacing from the circular catheter inside the pulmonary vein, if you're not conducting into the atrium, in, into the atrium, so this makes sure that you have exit block, but in, in only one condition. If you are capturing the myocardial sleep, if you have a local capture in the pulmonary vein, if you have uh, pacing inside the pulmonary vein and you have local capture and you're not capturing the atrium, this is exit, this is 100% exit block. Whenever you have entrance block and exit block from one set of pulmonary veins, this makes you damn sure that you have a complete isolation of this side of this side of veins, which whether they are left-sided or right-sided. Thank you. <laughs>